Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Tech Campus. If you're just joining us for the first time, Tech Campus is the largest technological event in Central Africa, and one of the largest in Africa. This year's edition is the third edition of Tech Campus, and the first ever virtual edition. My name is Adafi Ferrer, and I'm the Deputy Chief of Party of the USA funded Power Africa West Africa Energy Program in Accra, Ghana. And I'll be moderating and facilitating today's session between these enlightened speakers. So today we'll be discussing a very fascinating topic. Is data the new oil? So since the rise of the internet age and increasing value in data and technology, this is a topic that has been endlessly debated. Some experts say, yes, it is the new oil, that data in the 21st century is like oil in the 18th century, an immensely untapped bank asset. And like oil, for those who see data as fundamental value and learn to extract and use it, there will be huge rewards. However, some experts do not believe that data is the new oil. They go as far as saying it is supremely unhelpful to perpetuate the analogy that data could be the new oil. That oil is literally a li is liquid, fungible, and transportable, and is designed to take a barrel of oil from a field in Saudi Arabia and turn it into a home with electricity in Malabo or a moving commuter bus in Lagos. With data, by contrast, the abstract bits are functionally static. So today, we'll be speaking with leaders in both the oil technology and public administration sectors who are better positioned to share their insights as to whether oil-rich countries may someday derive their wealth from data. So today with us, we have His Excellency Gabriel Mbaga Lima, the Minister of Mines and Hydrocarbons at the Republic of Territorial Guinea. We also, have, we also have His Excellency Ekaio Macau Nange Oyana, Minister of Public Administration and Reforms at the Government of Equatorial Guinea, 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 and representing, and the, representing tech the tech sector. We have Norma Howley, the, the Chief Executive Officer of the Barcelona Landing Station, Barcelona, 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 Spain. Now, now, um, um, we've already spent some time starting, starting time session, session, so we're just, we're just going to get into it. And I'm going to start, start with a very, very general, general question. question. And Minister, I hope yes, that we'll start from you. you. Start from you. Do you think data is the new one? Okay, um, before, I, before I answer that question, I want to take this opportunity to first congratulate the campus and it is actually a great honor for me to participate. It is not really my sector, but I have seen what they did last year, and I have seen what they have done this year. And, and clearly, uh, one of the issues about the pandemic that is very positive is that we have been able to use technology like this that definitely are going to change the way that we work. Now, going straight to the question, and uh, the question is um, a little bit controversial for my sector, uh, because again it's really a question asking if we are finished with oil and then we have to focus on data so the question is is data the new oil my answer is yes i do believe that data is the new oil and mainly because it has a lot of similarity than oil you see when when data have started like oil everybody knew it was a very important commodity everybody knew that it was very important and it have great potential but it was only what we call it the, the five sisters that really capitalized that resource. And in oil, it was the big oil companies that they were dominating the entire world. In data, you have the Google, you have the Yahoo. And it's only when, unfortunately to say, they start breaking them up, it creates all the opportunity for the rest. Now, uh, the same thing with oil, the potential is there. And I do believe African countries have a specific, specific and very good potential for one key reason, data need uniqueness. It need culture. It doesn't want a lot of things that are uniform. And clearly the youth in Africa definitely have a lot of that uniqueness. The culture is there, diversity is there. So clearly the potential of data in Africa is very great. 
definitely to be able to go into the rest of the sector. Now, what you, you mentioned about uh, if data is the new oil, my response is yes, but that doesn't mean that data is going to replace oil. Oil need data, like data need oil. So, so that's a little bit to, to respond on that first question. Thank you very much, Minister Obiang. So we're hearing from an expert. This is the oil man of Equatorial Guinea. And if he says data is the new oil, then data is definitely the new oil. Private sector companies should listen to that advice. Okay, so um, we're bringing this to Minister Bakal, who is the Minister of Public Administration and Reforms at the Government of Equatorial Guinea. And is a perfect person to know how to turn um, private sector work into public profits for the government. So, Minister Bakal, can you tell us, in your opinion, do you think data is the new oil? Can it ever be as profitable as oil is to the government of Equatorial Guinea? Thank you, Ms. Adeko. I also want to start by congratulating the organizers of uh, Tech Campus. I had the opportunity to, to be part of the organizing team three years ago when we started Tech Campus, and I think it has grown to something that is uh, magical, uh, both for our country and, and, and the continent. So congratulations to, to all the organizers, and especially to Hirhe and all the big sponsors. I think we, get, we need to continue in this sense, and I hope that next year, uh, even though this year we had an online event, I hope that next year we will continue to have a mix of uh, an online, uh, online sessions and the physical events because it's, it's more impactful to, uh, for the event to be uh, organized partly online. It, 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 I think it helps us appreciate uh, the technology that is involved uh, to make it possible. Responding to the question, I, I do think that uh, data it's not even the new oil. I think it's better than oil. Uh, I'm sorry to say that. I know we have Gabrielle on, on the panel, uh, but uh, I think it's better than oil. Uh, it doesn't contaminate. It doesn't uh, pollute as much as oil. So that's why I think it's oil. But it's similar in the sense that uh, as oil, uh, data needs refining. Uh, without, if you don't refine data to make it information uh, that can uh, readily be useful, then it doesn't serve you. It's the same thing as having oil on the ground or when you bring it up and you don't refine it. And it also similar to, to oil in the sense uh, that it's a, a commodity that has a high value, even though most people don't agree on the, on the worth of individual or collective data. But I think that it has a huge value. We just have to look at uh, the five biggest companies in the world today, as uh, Gabrielle mentioned, we have Google, we have Amazon, we have Apple. All these big companies, they make money, uh, I think, thanks to, to data. So uh, from our perspective, data is the new oil and is better than oil. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Bacal. That is, that is, I'm sure, Norman, that is music to your ears. Well, definitely, I was thinking that I was going to be the only one defending the data sector here. Um, I'm happy to see that I am, I'm not the only one, so it's, it's quite good to hear that. Okay, so from your perspective as someone in the tech sector, how do you think data will become the new oil? Okay, uh, I would like to separate uh, the term data, because when we talk about data, we talk about a broad subject. And we can see data in, in two main applications. For example, we, saw, we see Amazon. Amazon is using data on the production processes and is using data on their relationship with the uh, uh, mass market. Then we will see data that some companies will use it uh, to improve the way they provide services or they manufacture uh, devices or they create new elements and then we see some other terms of companies which are the large companies that we know is that the companies that they have been able to bring this management of data all the way to the mass media and to the mass market and these companies are the ones who have created a really huge amounts of value in the market thank you so much norman that is so interesting to hear and i'm sure we have so many people watching this right now and I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions after this session. So also get ready for the audience uh, questions, we will, which will take about 15 minutes to the end of the session. 
Now, starting with um, Minister Bakao, as minister, you have overseen diverse sections of the economy, finance, economy and public investment, transport, postal services and telecommunications, and now public administration and reforms. So that is an enormous amount of data that you have that has passed through your hands. So in your previous experience as Minister of Economy and Public Investment, how would you monetize the data of the citizens of Equatorial Guinea? I think we can look at uh, this from two di different uh, perspectives. Uh, one perspective is the public administration perspective, and uh, the second one is the private sector perspective. From the public administration perspective, I think we need to understand that uh, the objective of any government is to satisfy the needs of, the, of their citizens. And uh, government usually do this by uh, designing uh, public policies and by delivering public goods and services. I think the amount of data, uh, e.g. citizens are not different from, and e.g. government are not different from government from other countries. I think the amount of data governments uh, collect on their citizens can be monetized or better used to improve, to improve uh, public uh, policies framing, which is public policies based on evidence, can also be used to, to boost the, the decision-making process, to make decisions based on, on facts and on data and evidence. And obviously, it can also be used to, to enhance uh, operational processes in the delivery of public goods and, and services. Obviously, monetizing data in this, uh, in this way is not glamorous, but is the most immediate for, for, for governments. For, for an asset uh, such as data uh, to be monetized, we don't, have to, we don't have to look at it from the revenue improvement perspective only. I think we also have to look at it from uh, the perspective of improving efficiency and productivity. And governments will be better served if they use data uh, to improve efficiency and productivity. If a better use of data and analytics are positioned governments to improve the decision making and deliver goods and services more efficiently, I think then government will be able to collect on both ends. On one side, they will be able to collect on the cost, save, cost and savings in efficiency uh, or improvement and productivity. On the other side, I think government would also be able to, to accomplish their main goal, which is to satisfy the needs of, of their citizens. From the private, uh, private sector uh, perspective, I think businesses here, as the same as businesses in Nigeria or in Ghana. So businesses, besides using data or information to improve their business processes and decisions, I think they can also use something that is readily available for most companies today, which is wrapping, wrapping information around their key products and services. Or they can also improve their relationship with their customers or do as uh, some other companies do, which is to sell uh, data to available markets. But for EG particularly, to, to reap the benefits of uh, data, we need to continue to work on some key issues. Number one is we need to continue to work on building capabilities for data collection. We need to continue working on building capability for data archiving and self-keeping. And we need to continue working on building capabilities for analytics. This is why, as a Minister of the Economy, we put a lot of emphasis in enhancing and uh, reinforcing the capabilities of the National Statistic, National Institute of Statistics and the Minister of uh, Telecommunications. We work tediously on building ICT infrastructure to make it uh, accessible and uh, and affordable to everyone, and to also uh, fostering an uh, environment such as Tech Campus uh, to create a space for human uh, development in sciences and, and ICT. So I think is uh, the key lesson here is that we shouldn't looking we shouldn't be looking at monetizing data on the perspective of improving only benefits or revenues. We should look at it in improving efficiency and improving product productivity. I think government will be better positioned to use data in that way and businesses 
can develop new infrastructure and new business models to monetize data in other ways. That's fantastic. That is so enlightening. So this, if this is a government stance, and it definitely shows the country is headed on the right path. Because I know Equatorial Guinea has had several advancements recently, scaling up their infrastructure, providing free internet to the citizens, free Wi-Fi in public schools, and little things like this, just from the ground up, is enough to build this capacity that we're talking about, that the government can utilize to, to make sure data becomes valuable. Thank you very much, Mr. Bacal, for that um, snippet. And to speak on the private sector, um, I'm very sorry I hadn't introduced him earlier. We have Mr. Fidel Enbo, who is the Vice President and Country Manager of Cosmos Energy in Equatorial Guinea. Um, Mr. Enbo, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Fantastic. I'm so sorry. I couldn't hear you earlier, so I, I, I thought um, you were not in the picture. But since you're here, as someone in the private sector, um, we've heard from public sector, um, people in the oil, ga oil and gas industry in the public sector. As someone in the private sector, do you believe that data is the new oil? Yes, of course. Um, as my predecessor has pointed out, uh, data is a key and instrumental so i'm going to go further on my explanation uh companies like cosmos the data is so important as it informs us everything that we do but data the raw data is not actually where the true value comes from the true value comes from the expertise and human being who analyze and interpret the data. It comes from the expertise and the ability to analyze the data. We need people to make sense of the data that we collected over the years. So let me give you an example of the use and interpretation of the data, which can, uh, has informed us projects across the Africa. Many of my colleagues from the exploration group were part of the Triton Energy back in, in, in 1999 when we first discovered Sabre Field. In addition with the Sabre Field, there were a number of discoveries associated with this, which we, know, we now know as Okume Complex. So this fields were first discovered by uh, Triton Energy, which was acquired later in 2001 by Hess. In addition to our uh, chief exploration officer, many of our team members were part of this development and operation of this producing assets, which prove that Cosmos has high level of integrity knowledge of these assets. Now, with this discovery of Seba and Okume, Cosmos has developed an upper Cretaceous concept, which has been used across other parts in Africa. I'll give you an example. The discovery of Jubilee and Ten offshore Ghana, we used the same concept of Cretaceous, which has helped us with the data to understand and make a number of other discoveries. The same concept we applied for Ghana and Senegal, and we end up with huge gas discovery. Back in 2017, with the knowledge and the exploration knowledge that we built over, over years, we were able to come back in Equatorial Guinea. And we secured the acquisition of interest in Block G, where we have the Seba and Okume Field, which continues to bring opportunities for Cosmos. In addition to this, we also acquired four exploration blocks which bring 
a, uh, a short tackle uh, tie back to the existing infrastructure. So what I want to tell you all this is that the data and the technology are really, are really in, uh, important for companies like Cosmos as we make good use of it and we make a discovery. With the learning, we've been able to build on experience that create value to the country and to Cosmos. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fidel. That's an interesting link you're making there with uh, showing data and tech as supporters of the oil and gas industry and not necessarily competitors. So thank you very much for that. Um, going now to, uh, to Minister Gabriel. So as the minister of one of Africa's most profitable oil economies, your office is literally a treasure trove of data. This is gained from dealing with operators and trading the country's oil on the international ma market. So how has the data collected in your experience overseeing Equatorial Guinea's oil economy ensured that the country always gets the best deal on the best possible? So do you see a straight line from the data you've collected in your, in your experience to the oil revenues Equatorial Guinea has been able to receive? First of all, the, the answer to that question is yes. And I did mention something the last time when I was speaking, is that oil need data like data need oil. You see, the biggest advantage that data have done to our industry is that it have allowed that usually an oil field, once it was discovered, it used to take a minimum of five years. You needed to do another drilling, you needed to do some processing, some evaluation, some more work, and then after five years you produce. Now with all the data, with all the new technology that we have, it usually takes two years, and it used to be called fast track, but now it's a normal thing. The same thing what data has to our industry is that in our industry it's very important to be able to control pressure, to be able to control the, the amount of water, the amount of gas that you do in the field, and all that data that we are gathering, all that data that we have learned from another field definitely helps for our industry to develop. Uh, the best example is how the United States has become from an imported country of oil to an exported oil. And it has been mainly because of data. They have 100 or 2,000 wells, and through mm -hmm. that data, they have been able to, in a way, been able to increase the production that rapidly. I'll give you the best example. The last time that I participated in an oil and gas conference in Houston, I was expecting going to a conference and find and half of them to be oil and gas companies, service companies. But the amazing thing is half of the companies were actually data companies. They were Google, they were Microsoft, they were everybody there because again, our industry need more than ever the data. This is why the majority of the IT uh, are needed in our operations. And it's not just to be able to have emails, but if they able, um, is able to be able to send data to go all the way to the headquarters, in the past, you needed to send your country manager or your geologist to go to the platform. Right now, we have the data straight from the operations all the way to the headquarters. I can be in the ministry. I can follow up what ExxonMobil is doing, what Noble is doing. And the best example has been this pandemic. We are in the middle of this pandemic, and that has not really affected us. We have continued working because we do the video conference, and that definitely comes into, again, the definition of data. It's not just the input that you have, but it's the entire information that you have. Because in the video conference, what you do is you don't just speak. You are able to do presentation. You are able to share the information. And you are able to connect so many people. So I have recently a video conference with an oil company that you have one representative who was in Russia, another one in Singapore, another one in Houston. And then, of course, in, we were here in Equatorial Guinea. And we are able to all connect between each other and being able to do it. So clearly, when I say that oil need data and data need oils, and especially oil, because what data does is that it reduces costs and actually it reduces time. And definitely oil and gas, those are the two factors that is reduced, it actually gives you a lot of profit. So definitely data have allowed to have more profits. And at the same time for us as a ministry, 
never in the history of oil, governments have been able to have so much data to be able to compare when we negotiate contracts, because now we can know what Nigeria is doing, what Cameroon is doing, but it's not just what they do in the contract, but also how their operations are working. If one of the operations are actually producing too much water, or they are actually injecting, or they are doing different mechanisms. So those are the information, definitely the data have changed. It's never something that is going to replace the other one, but I think data definitely has been a key factor that have allowed the more productive and beneficiary for the oil industries. That's why data is very much welcome. It will never replace the oil and gas uh, men and women guts, because sometimes when you need to drill, the data can tell you there is oil there, but sometimes you need that gut from oil and gas. You say, you know, our feeling doesn't see that oil there. And, and it doesn't matter what the seismic say, it doesn't matter what the data say, you only know when you have oil and gas when you drill. So you still need that human element. So you don't think one day machines will take over everything, that we still need the human beings in there? Yeah, well, that's, that's what they say in a lot of things. They say that on computers, the same chairs. I think there's still the human factor is still important and definitely is helping for the exploration, it helps for the development, transportation, and it's definitely a tool that will reduce, increase more um, awareness for uh, how the industry works, for information. But at the same time, it's extremely good for the environment because we are able to track much better what's happening. So it's not really a surprise. So, so I think data is, for, is going to be very helpful for our industry. That's why we encourage a lot of the engineers and geologists not to focus on just the hardcore oil and gas, but also to make sure that that technology is there because at the end, you know, with the laptop from anywhere in the world, you can help an oil and gas industry. Thank you so much, Minister Obiang. And thank you for also highlighting the regional integration that we're experiencing, uh, learning from the different countries in the region. So, it, so, so, so I feel like our countries are not just acting on their own. Each one is dependent on the other. So thank you for pointing out that link. So now let's go to Norman. As the only tech person on the panel, it would be great to hear from you exactly how valuable data can be. I mean, we all know the value in the oil and gas industry, but you know the value overall. So how valuable can that data be? And how do you think that value can either be commensurate or possibly overtake the oil industry? Norman, you are mute. Let, let me explain a little bit how uh, the data system works. It's clearly that we gather data, but what we do with the data? With the data, we create uh, mathematical models. And with these mathematical models, we understand how, how behavior or some behaviors are happening. For example, uh, we can predict with the payments with the credit card, we can predict what kind of payments or what kind of behaviors uh, they will bring a payment which is a fraud. Mm -hmm. okay? And then with these mathematical models, you can build algorithms. And then with these algorithms, then you can apply them to some functionalities. And here is maybe the beauty, and here is maybe also the, intera the interaction with a human being. And I'm going to put an example of it. For example, we, uh, many of us, we use Google Maps, mm -hmm. okay? When we select Google Maps, we uh, write a destination place, okay? And then, but who selects the path that we are going to take for that destination? The human being or a machine? So, in fact, we are relying this trust on a machine. It's the machine who decides for us the path that we are going to follow, okay? This path we we'll follow everything that has learned, but we have to be aware that we are also bringing some of the decisions that we're taking today and we're giving them to machine. Mm. So we have this case in Google Maps, but we have this case also on Netflix. For example, we should switch on Netflix and maybe Netflix 
is deciding or is pushing us to decide the picture of the of the film that they want us to watch. So all this data that we know as uh, that our repositories once possess, they can create some patterns that in some case they can help us to get to a destination in some place cases they can help us to consumption and this means revenues in some cases maybe more different they can uh, help us or they can bring us to purchase things like it happens with amazon in amazon they collect our data and they push us or they constantly bring us to advertisement not necessarily when we are in amazon uh, if we are in some other platforms, if we have been browsing about cars or we have, we have been browsing about parts, about computers, about anything, constantly it, it will pop up with advertisements about the element that we have been searching on Google. Okay, trying to, to push us to buy this element. So, all this information that we see in data, bringing it to the mass market media, it, it is translated in value and value uh, finally is translated in business and here is when data generate mass value the other thing is that we are of course uh, data generates value in the production process of the business in the oil and gas industry in the financial sector in the in the manufacturing business but where it reaches the human being in a massive way is in platforms as e-commerce, as movies, as we have seen Google, with Google Maps, so I can put an, another example. If you have a lot of matching applications that uh, will give you an indication of the people who you, ca you can meet, and probably is also an algorithm, the one that who is going to decide who will you be meeting, okay? So we're putting in hands of many applications, decisions, that they, they correspond to the human being and that they are basic data at this moment in time. That's very interesting. Thank you so much, Norman. It's very enlightening to hear from, we see someone in the sector who is able to show us a broad overview of what tech and data can do. Um, so I'm going to go to, to uh, Minister Bakar. The governor of California, Gavin Newsom, proposed an interesting idea. He proposed an ambitious data dividend plan. So this is where companies like Facebook or Google will pay their users a fraction of the revenue they derive from the user's data. Now, obviously no one took this very seriously, but do you think this is something that can be done? This is obviously speaking from the government side. Do you think it's possible to make tech companies who use, who utilize users' data, is it possible to make them pay some of their revenue to those users? I think it's an interesting proposal uh, from the perspective of uh, public policy. I think it's an interesting proposal. But uh, morally and logically, it makes sense. It's justifiable because so far what we do at the moment is that we consent for our data to be collected uh, while accessing online platforms such as uh, Instagram, Facebook, Netflix. We consent for our data to be collected for internal use. We never consent for our data to be commercialized to third parties. So it makes perfect sense uh, to demand that companies that actually do sell our data and information to, to other companies pay something back to, to the contributors to that data. So that's why I say that logically and morally is justifiable. But I think there are two important issues that need to be addressed uh, for the idea to be realizable and sustainable in the long term. First is the issue of the, the value of our data. How much is our data worth, both collectively and individually? The, my email address, my social preferences, my drinking preferences, how much, what is the value of that data and that information? Uh, I think most experts in the field, uh, they, they don't agree, I think, or they agree on the, on the fact that there is not uh, an easy way in determining uh, the value of individual data or aggregate, aggregate, aggregate data that has been aggregated. So in that sense, if we don't know uh, how much our data is worth, 
it will be very difficult to determine how much money or dividends should be paid to each individual contributor to that uh, specific uh, data set. Secondly, there is the issue of the structure of a data dividend. Uh, should it be structured as a special tax that government collect and, uh, and use to procure public goods and services? Or should it be in the form of a, a trust fund that is accessible to entrepreneurs and researchers? Or should it simply be uh, a direct payment, a, a dividend payment to each individual contributor? I think each option and each structure has its pros and, and cons, but a direct payment to each individual contributor to the data will finally result in insignificant amounts being paid to us and that will essentially defeat the purpose uh, or the main uh, ambition behind the idea proposed by, by the governor of California, which is uh, income inequality and wealth distribution. Because the data that is being sold, that revenue, I think, needs to be equally distributed. But if at the end of the day I'm going to get a payment of, let's say, 50 cents or one dollar a year, that would defeat the purpose. I think the two options, special taxing or trust fund accessible to entrepreneurs or researchers, those ideas would make more sense. In conclusion, I think that uh, these two issues uh, will need time and expertise uh, to be allocated uh, to, in order to, to assess uh, all the pros and cons and all the feasible ways this can be done. Besides that, there is also the issue of, of, of privacy. I think governments should protect individual privacy and the privacy of the, of the citizens. If we give the idea that uh, privacy is for sale, then I think we would be violating an, a fundamental uh, right that all humans have. So we need to be careful in not giving access to, to people to think that they should be selling or giving away the individual, process, uh, the individual freedoms for, for money, for a dollar or ten dollars or a hundred million dollars. So this two issue, what is the worth, what is data worth, what is structured to make it possible, and what are some of the uh, issues relating to privacy that needs to be solved. If we address them, uh, I think the idea can, can become a reality and sustainable in the long term. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. This is actually this position you have shown here, which this position you're, you're telling us about here is actually widely shared, you know, by a lot of experts. They like the idea, but they're not sure of the implementation. And I think this idea is based on the idea of the Alaskan Permanent Fund, which is where the government of Alaska gives annual payment to citizens of Alaska based on the state's petroleum revenue. So people think, oh, maybe we can get tech companies to do the same. But you have very, very brilliantly outlined how that cannot be entirely possible and the dangers if we decide to go down that path. Thank you for that very, very enlightening explanation. Um, now, going to, to Minister Obiang, to Minister Gabriel. So... I know, obviously, we, we Equatorial Guinea is in your main source of revenue is oil is oil and gas. Um, and we're building, you know, the private tech sector, all the different sectors in Equatorial Guinea. But do you think that oil producing countries all over the world should look towards a future in which um, data will be prioritized over oil? Is it wise to pivot? to data which could become a money-making venture or should oil producing countries still keep prioritizing their oil revenues? Thank you, Thank you for the question. Um, I did agree to participate in this tech campus uh, mainly because I do believe it's a very important platform for the youth, for the technology. I am not an expert regarding data. Uh, probably some of my, my co-panelists probably know more than me on data. But what I know is oil. And one of the things that I have learned from oil is that this is a resource that many African countries we do have. Now, for to turn right now to African countries, stop looking for oil and gas and go into data, do agriculture. That's, in a way, criminal. Why? Because we have the resources. This is the first time in our histories 
that African countries can in a way start controlling the resources. So a lot of people are asking you, you have to diversify. I agree. We should do tourism, we should do agriculture, we should do many other things, but we should not forget about oil. How many years and decades Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Emirates have been doing oil? They never forget about the oil. Now, what we need to do is we need to see how we can incorporate this new technology data to help us. Right now, with the data, Equatorial Guinea, as a small country, in a couple of years, we could be actually producing our own fields. We could be able to have enough information. I'll give you a couple of information that very few people know. The majority of the IT uh, infrastructure in Equatorial Guinea, in the oil and gas, is done by Equatorial Guineas. And it's managed by Equatorial Guineas. And some of the experts only come when there is really necessary, but the majority is done by Equatorial Guineas. So the same thing has to do with oil. I think our industry needs those use with that technology. It's not just the data, it is the technology, but we should never forget about oil. Equatorial Guinea have oil, have gas. We have built from with our, with our gas and methanol plant. We export LNG, and definitely we're gonna think about building a refinery. So to say an oil or African country to say, forget about oil and gas, mineral, go into data, we will never be able to be at the balance with other countries. What has the, the North America, or the Europeans have been doing all this year, training their individual human resources on data. Now, what we need to do is we need to focus on what we have and what we do best. And what we do best is oil and gas. And what we need to do is we need to invest our human resources and all this data in oil and gas. I think we need to be more efficient. Equatorial Guinea has been the last country in the Gulf of Guinea having oil and gas. Nigeria have oil and gas before us, Cameroon, Gabon, uh, Congo, Angola, we were the last one. But now it looks like Equatorial Guinea has been the one producing more efficient. And it has been done for two reasons. One, we learn from them. And second one, there is technology that allows us to do it much better. So the answer is no. We should not forget about oil and gas. Oil and gas is a resource that belongs to Equatorial Guinea. We make more money doing oil and gas than vegetable and cocoa. So we should not go to vegetable and cocoa. Data, maybe when we have as many infrastructure uh, as the European, the red, maybe we can go into data. But yes, we will work on the data. Data can help us. But to say that we should forget about oil and gas, I think that's criminal. And I do not, and I said to all the conference, I will never apologize for Equatorial being in oil and gas and keep producing because that's definitely the resource that have made Equatorial Guinea to change. If Equatorial Guinea have today roads, have infrastructure, have electricity, and have all this matter, has not been because of the IMF, has not been because of the World Bank, it has been because of our own resources. It has been because of the leadership for us to take our resources and put it in the ground. So I think data is important. Data is gonna allow us to do a leap forward, but we should not forget about the resources. And you have to remember, we haven't even started the mining that is even bigger than the oil in Equatorial Guinea. Ms. Albiang, I love your passion about this subject. You're clearly the right man to lead Equatorial Guinea's oil and gas sector. And this is clearly why it's been so successful, because you truly believe in the product you're selling. To you, it's not just um, a revenue. It is something you believe that is building your country. So I, I think, you know, we're very glad that so many people are watching and witnessing this and they can come away from this say, you know, Minister Obiang is not just the Minister for Petroleum, he's an oil ambassador for Equatorial Guinea. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I'd like to remind the audience, like I said at the beginning, to please send in your questions. We're almost coming to the round of the panel, to the end of the panel questions. And we're collating all your questions that you're sending in and we'll ask the speaker. So please send in your questions. Thank you so much, Minister Obiang. Um, now coming to um, Mr. Fidel from Cosmos Energy. Um, as a private sector oil company, information like your sales data, your oil pricing data, customer data can be worth billions. But it's, it's not, but not necessarily outside the oil industry. So since the data you possess needs the success of the oil industry to be valuable, how would you suggest retaining its value if the oil industry were to decline? And we hope not, for Minister Albion's sake, it will not decline. 
Or how would you suggest retaining the value of the data you have amassed outside of oil and gas? So thank you very much once again, Adeko. And very glad to be here and kind of provide uh, some of the feet. Uh, some of the grounding that I've built over the past uh, years in the oil and gas sector. Um, first of all, I want to tell you that uh, the oil and gas industry will continue uh, for a long time and the transition on the energy uh, will take several years. Uh, so that's mean the data and oil I really combine that goes combined and and we cannot separate from each other so there are four basic important aspects that I want to highlight around this area so companies will be focusing on lowering the cost on improving efficiency on lowering emission improving output and product yields in order to meet all those objectives, data will be so important. Without a data, you're not going to be able to improve the efficiency. You're not going to be able to uh, uh, increase the productivity. So I want to reemphasize that data will be very important and highlight the fact that Cosmos proposition value is human being. Because with all this data, if you don't have the knowledge, the experience to interpret the data, to make into, uh, to make sense of the data, you won't be able to do anything with the data. So with all this, there is a challenge associated with it. How do we analyze the data? How do we use it? And how do we make the proper action? So as you pointed out earlier, Oil and gas industry is very fascinating a business. And to the current world demand of cleanness energy, the technology in one hand, which is data, and the oil will continue to play a crucial point. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for those. Again, also very, very enlightening. And it's great because it's kind of a, a, a flip side of what everyone has been talking about, but it's great to hear this from the private sector side as well. Um, so now for our last uh, set of panel questions for, for, for Mr. Norman. So I mentioned earlier, you know, about Governor Newsom's data dividend plan. So seeing as companies like Facebook and Google mine customer data, while providing them with a free user experience. Do you see a situation where Facebook and Google or Twitter users could ever be owed any revenue? I know Minister Bakar gave us you know, his perspective, but I, I'd like to hear yours from a private sector tech perspective. Do you think users of social media could ever be owed revenue by these massive IT companies? Uh, the first things that uh, we, we have to look at is about data ownership. Uh, we have a model of ownership that uh, has been working for several hundred years, that is land ownership. We have a very well-established method for land ownership, and we know that we go to a notary and we transfer property. But what about the data? We don't have this framework for the data. So we, who is the owner of the data? Okay, and here is the key. So today, what we are facing is that we're facing a lack of framework for data uh, ownership schemes. So what we think, and I think that in this in this line, I go, you know, we go in line with Mr. Bacale, is that there should be a work from the legal sector, from the political sector, and also from the industry to establish some rules regarding data ownership. Otherwise, we don't think that uh, there will be a, a very well-established framework that will allow uh, to, to, to share revenues, To everything is going to be under the subjective opinion of a private company or a, of a public entity. So we have to create 
this model, we have to create this framework, and probably this framework will take some years, because unfortunately, uh, the industry is going faster than the, 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 what the legal world is, but it's true that the legal world later on creates, let's say, a framework that is stable for a long time to come. Sorry, I was on mute. I said thank you very much. Thank you so much, Norman. We do see how Africa is accelerating in this fourth industrial revolution. We're a bit behind in the other um, industrial revolutions, but with this one, Africa is right there, you know, moving with the times, even innovating and not just, you know, collecting as we were used to. And this is obviously due to the public officials we now have, the, the young entrepreneurs we now have, um, events like Tech Campus really encourages this kind of innovation. Governments like Equatorial Guinea that supports these young people, that supports its sectors, are the ones making sure that Africa is able to, you know, stand and perform on the global stage. Now, when we are actually finished with the panel questions, we have about six minutes or so to the end of the panel, but we do have a couple of audience questions that I'm going to ask the panel members at large and any one of you can elect to answer these questions before we, I give a quick summary and we round up. So we have a question from Mariano from Equatorial Guinea. And Mariano asks, is data already contributing to the economy of Equatorial Guinea? I feel like we've answered this in some respect during the panel, but I don't know if you want, there's another angle we want to give Mariano. Anyone can take the question. Just raise your hand. Yes, please. Yes, please, Minister McCallum. Oh, thank, thank you. I think the answer is yes, definitely. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think both uh, Minister Gabriel and uh, Mr. Fidel pointed out the contribution of uh, the digital economy and the oil sector, oil being the main source of revenue of Equatorial Guinea, and the, the availability of technology and information that is, that is helping the industry to develop more oil fields is contributing. That's an economic and financial contribution to the economy of, a, uh, of Equatorial Guinea. Besides that, I had an interesting conversation with uh, the of CEO of uh, Hetesa the other day at the opening ceremony of Tech Campus uh, regarding uh, the amount of money Hetesa is making on data only, not voice, but the data. Uh, and it's amazing that uh, on a weekly basis, Hetesa can go up to uh, almost $300,000 uh, a week on data alone. And that's an interesting development because two years ago, uh, Hetesa was actually losing money on, on, on data. So this and other contribution in, in other industries uh, I, I think uh, are evident, uh, sufficient evident that uh, data and information, uh, because we use the term data broadly, as uh, Norman pointed out, we should uh, actually talk about data and information, the information that is provided by data. But I wanted to also contribute on the, on the question posed uh, that was directed to Mr. Gabriel regarding if data should be substituted for oil for in the in African context. I think uh, no, because African countries, they need uh, they, need, they still need resources for financing development. And at the moment, natural resources are the only way for African countries to get that, uh, that revenue that can help them actually position themselves for the, uh, the digital economy. Data and information, ICT, are not substitute for other industries. They actually help enhance other industries. So I do agree that Africa should continue to focus on natural resources while also uh, putting a lot of emphasis on uh, developing the ICT sector. I hope that answers Mariano's question. Um, then we have a, another question again to the panel at large. Um, is there a plan by the government to strengthen the ICT sector? I think the presence of Tech Campus probably answers that question again, but and the presence of you know government officials participating and supporting, but it, it feels like this is not enough for this person. They want to know more. So is, is, do we know of a plan by the government to strengthen the ICT sector? I'm sorry to monopolize uh, 
the, the, the mic, uh, but as a former uh, Minister of Telecommunication, I can say yes. Uh, I can say, I think uh, three years ago, uh, actually Tech Campus was developed in that context. Uh, three years ago, we developed a, a national strategy to, to strengthen the ICT sector of the, company, of, the, of the country, and that's the strategy that is being implemented now. Uh, we had the campus as a, an innovation. We also have, uh, I think three years ago, if you talk to any, any EG citizen, you will realize that the, the affordability of ICT services has improved thanks to the implementation of that strategy. Besides the fact that uh, the investment made by the government in ICT infrastructure is paying off right now, uh, we invested a lot of money, we positioned ourselves uh, a couple of years ago in fiber optics and thus is this fiber that is allowing HITGE and uh, the other partners to organize their campus online today. So yes, the government has a strategy that has been set up and developed and we, uh, the government is actually implementing that strategy at the moment. Obviously, there are certain things that, that we can improve, that we can do, but uh, it's good to know that the government has the focus on, on that. Yeah, I can personally say, because I mean, I'm Nigerian, I live in Accra, Ghana, and I don't live in Equatorial Guinea now, I used to, but at least I know from this end, there's a lot of other Africans who are seeing the impact of what HITE is doing and what the government of Equatorial Guinea is doing. I know there's a lot of internet presence about the country's achievements, the infrastructure they're doing. And I remember when I think there was a post about the free Wi-Fi in public schools. Everybody was like, how, you know, we don't have that in Ghana. We don't have that in Nigeria. And Equatorial Guinea is leading in that aspect. So this is something that I think not only the citizens of Equatorial Guinea can see, but the citizens of other countries in Africa are seeing that this is what this country is doing and are impressed by it. I know I'm very impressed by, you know, the wife, free Wi-Fi in public spaces, um, in the schools, you know, what tech campus is doing. So um, I, I can, I mean, I, I don't have to be told, but I can see that the government is doing something. And I'm very excited to see what the government will do in the future. Um, so we have a, a last question. And I think this is for Minister Gabriel. This is from uh, Stephanie from Equatorial Guinea. And she says she understands that the hydrocarbon sector but the, they would, the, she would like to know if, you know, some of that support that the government gives to the hydrocarbon sector can be diversified across other sectors or how will it be diversified across other sectors? Um, again, thank you for the question and thank you for Stephanie for that question too. And I think the answer is yes. And we should not try to innovate something exclusively of Equatorial Guinea. We have so many examples. This is why in the current area that we are, information like uh, Wikipedia, information like uh, YouTube, information like the internet can teach you so much. There is so many examples of countries, sizes like Equatorial Guinea, like Trinidad and Tobago, countries like, uh, and in this case, Singapore, countries like Kuwait, countries like the Emirates, country like Malaysia, like Indonesia, they have already gone through that stage of having the oil, having the boom, and then taking some of the resources to invest in that. And the best example, it's really Equatorial Guinea, because the only, we have, the only thing we have been doing is copy what those countries have been doing. Trinidad and Tobago, Singapore, the rest. What did we do? And this was mainly because of the leadership of His Excellency the President. He said, when the oil is going, money oil is going to come, we're going to put it in the ground. That's the only place that nobody's going to take it out. So what we did, we did road. We are one of the countries in Africa, we have the highest per capita of uh, investment in roads. We have electricity going to everywhere. We have all the infrastructure in all the different cities that we have done. We avoid one of the biggest problems that oil producing countries have had in the, in the past is that everybody concentrate in the two urban areas. And why nobody wants to go to Malawi and Bata? Because you can live in Mongomo, you can live in Luba, you can live in the different places. So the answer is yes, we need to keep diversifying, but there is very important that one of the key criteria for the growth of that diversification is entrepreneurs. We have the road, we have the electricity, we have the hotel, we have the infrastructure. What we need now is we need that entrepreneurs 
Those entrepreneurs that can take the IT, that can take the road, that can take the tourists, and can take us to the next level. That which are wait and which are um, forgetting our key resources. This is oil and gas. You still can be like Qatar. You still can be like Hawaii. They're still producing oil, but they have invested in a lot of things. We have the natural resource, and, and this is the soil. It's very rich. Agriculture it could be critical. The tourism is very important too, but also the human resources. Equatorial Guinea have invested so much in education. We have sent so many youth to university in different places, from China, United States, Canada, everywhere. They're coming back. What we need to do is we need to harbor those human resources to make sure that they can go to the next level. Uh, before the pandemic, my key individuals that I really dedicated, and it was the more important for me, were the engineers. And the engineers and the geologists, because they were telling me what the oil, what they were doing. Right now, it's the IT people. Which all my IT people are lost. I cannot have video conference. I cannot cook my internet. So my IT people are with me 24 hours. They used to be down in the basement. You never saw them. But <laughs> they are the ones who really actually doing all the work. So clear the IT. And this is not only my ministry. If you go to every, and you talk with every single company in Equatorial Guinea, and you ask them, who are the people right now that are, that are working the best, and it's amazing what they do? They would say, the IT people. Recently, companies like Noble Energy, actually they're giving an award and recognition, the amazing job that the IT people in Equatorial Guinea, the youth in their own company, did to make sure that they never lost connection with Houston, with Israel, with different places. So clearly, I think it's very important that we harvest that resource. That doesn't mean we need to forget about oil. What we need to do is harvest the people that we already have trained in the oil and gas to go into the next sector. My future hope will be that young engineers who have been uh, gone through a scholarship to oil and gas come back, work in the oil industry, after two years, quit the business and do their own business, and then go develop. And I'm very happy because that's happening a lot. And, and, and I'm very happy because the best example right now, we have next to us, you know, you have the minister Bakali. He actually was sponsored by an oil company. He mm -hmm. studied, he worked with the company. He came back and he decided, I want to work for my country. He quit and he had been minister. He do a lot of things. So a lot of Jews in Equatorial Guinea need to take the example of minister Bakali, trained by the oil and gas industry, use the resources and then do something else. And I have to say, even though some people will say that I'm too, too optimistic, Equatorial Guinea have the best and brightest Jews in Africa. The problem is how we can be able to gather that energy, that human resources, that technology. What they have, this is the brightest from technology, from, from training, from agriculture, the rest. The key thing is to be able to harvest, to give them that freedom so they can be able to capitalize on that resources. Because what I said before, Data is like oil. You just need to be able to harvest that data. And those kids right now, you know, they're that very good thing in Facebook, that very good thing in, in Instagram, they're very good in even getting free Wi-Fi. You know, they don't need the codes. They even know how to, to hack them to any Wi-Fi. And I have seen it. So I'm very careful with that. But the key thing is that you need to be able to harvest. And I have to say one more time to conclude, Tech Campus has been great. Last year, I saw what they did. And I saw how great Equatorial Guinea kids could do, you know, dismantling a, an iPhone, doing a different one. And these are the things that need to be able to do because this is our future. In our future, I know people say, you know, it shouldn't be oil and gas. Oil and gas will be there. But what we need to do is not to lower the oil and gas. It's to keep the level on oil and gas. It's actually low, hiring the other sectors so the other sectors are a high as oil and gas. So again, the key thing is, yes, we need to invest and we need to keep, and this is something that I do a lot in the oil and gas industry. We make sure that the investment in the youth is very important, but we need to be able to harvest the youth that have been already trained, that right now they are involved in tech campus to make sure that they could be the future resources. And it's not going to be just oil, but it will be the resources of our people. And there is example like Japan, like Singapore, that do not depend on the resources but the depend on the human resources.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Mr. Obiang, for another impassioned response. Stephanie, I hope that answered your question. It definitely answered mine. Um, I know I said I was going to wrap up, but you have, there's so many people watching. We have so many questions coming in and people are begging me to give five more minutes for questions. So please, we're just going to take a couple more questions. This is a very popular panel. You are very popular men. So just know it's your popularity that's making us stay this long. I think that's um, Minister Gabriel. He's very popular. No, you're you're drawing the crowds as well. You're drawing the crowds. Okay, we have a question for Fidel. So someone wants to know, anonymous, they didn't say their name. They want to know how private companies like Cosmos Energy supports the ICT sector. I'm sure it's very clear uh, because uh, so, uh, as many so sorry, let me just add on to that. So not just support the ICT sector, but how do you help to also to promote startup companies? Uh, if I got your question very correctly, so you're asking me how a company like Cosmos can support ICT companies. Um, yes. So the answer is very clear. Um, in the country, we have laws and regulation that empower the local uh, content to kind of participate in the, business, in the oil and gas business sector. So that's one key element. And uh, the second key element, um, I'm going to talk uh, strictly on behalf of Cosmos, is um, we really value the local content, the local resources. So for every opportunity out there, we're going to we're going to give opportunity to the local people uh, to kind of uh, take chances to bring themselves up. But there is a clear message that I want to send to these people. Um, you know, as we pointed out, that data is so important. Uh, but the interpretation, the analysis, the advance on how to use all this data, how to use the technology to, be, to become competent, to become competitor to international art company or uh, service companies is where the key uh, message lies on. Because um, even though you are a local company, you need to demonstrate ability to deliver it, and that's a key thing. Uh, you're not going to be hired just because you are local. There are certain standards, there are certain uh, accomplishments that we are looking for. So even, be, even though having the advantage of the law and the regulation, which empower all the local company, you still need to demonstrate the ability to deliver it. So uh, all those people, ICT people, and uh, as we're saying that every day, every year, uh, the data and the technology will keep gaining more and more field. So there is plenty of opportunity for those people in the near future. All right, thank you very much, Fidel. Thank you. Um, so I guess we have our roundup question. This question is, I would really like to hear from all of the participants for this one. This is a question from Mike from Gabon. And he's asking, how do you see Tech Campus in the next 10 years? What do you project for Tech Campus in 10 years? And as like I said, I wanted to hear from everybody on this. So, Norman, I will start with you. How do you see Tech Campus in 10 years? Well, I would like to see uh, it as, a, as an experiment of ideas, an experiment of entrepreneurs, but more in a consolidated way. Okay, I think today, the, we can say that with Tech Campus today, the, the, the soup is, is boiling, okay? And now we have to extract the, the results of it. So we have to uh, transform the ideas into enterprises, into startups, and in, in, into clusters, into mm -hmm. companies that they can succeed and they can support and they can pull all the sector. Okay? 
I think we are at the beginning of a trip, of a long trip, and I think that uh, in in ten years we should be a strong. We, we should we should see a strong sector, a cluster sector. I would say coming out of ten campus. This is what we we would like to see in ten years, and what we think that uh, ten campus will be in ten years. From awesome. Us. Thank you so much, Norman. Before I move on. We just got a really quick sneak question in for you. Like I said, very popular panel. I'm very sorry. Um, as an EU company, as rep representative of an EU company, what is your vision about the future of data in Equatorial Guinea? Well, uh, I think we are we are facing a very fast world. Okay, in in pace of data, and. Last month, there was a panelist, uh, a philosopher, who was talking even that uh, this, we were going to, to a process of uh, data colonialism, okay? Uh, we had some kind of risk that uh, some data was going to be managed by very few people, or even that the expertise of data was going to be managed by very few people. And I think that the, the best, uh, line that any country can take and, and uh, it's clear that in Equatorial Guinea this is being taken and it has been expressed by the ministers here, is that to get this expertise by their own citizens, by their own young people. Today we have tools uh, in internet, you have tools to work in artificial, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, every time these tools are becoming more and more popular, more and more accessible, the knowledge is there, and what is in, interesting and what is, I would say, mandatory is that there is the youth from Equatorial Guinea gets to get this knowledge and to apply this knowledge, so they are becoming or they can become independent and they, they can, de can keep their independence in the data field. Thank you so much, Norman. I, I, so that question came from Angel from Malaysia. So I hope that answered Angel's question. And so considering our roundup, going to Minister Gabriel, how do you see Tech, tech Campus in, in the next 10 years? I know you've been a huge supporter of Tech Campus so far. So um, we would like to know how you see Tech Campus projecting in the next 10 years. Okay. This is going to be my view. It's going to look like, you know, I'm very biased because I'm a minister of Equatorial Guinea and I'm not going to speak about my country. But I do believe that the tech campus in 10 years is going to be the more important, and even right now, the more important uh, high-tech uh, infrastructure event in Africa. Now, we do have key criteria that are very important that people need to remember. First, the infrastructure, and this is very important. You see, it has been because of the pandemic, because if not, we will be fully packed in Sipopo, or even in Sipopo, in the conference, with so many people, with the hotel, with everything, and everybody from different places, from Gabon, from the world, they will be coming. I did it last year. I did two key infrastructure, uh, infrastructure meeting conference, that it was people coming from everywhere from the world. So it has been because of the pandemic that people have not gone there. So we have the infrastructure. We have the electricity. We have a key. The other key one is the infrastructure, not only infrastructure in road, the airports, the transportation, but the key one that I think is the more important, and this is what is going to make us more different, is the youth. Now, when I say the youth, I'm not talking about the youth in the street. I am, and I consider myself a young minister. Minister Bacale is a young minister. We have Minister Cesar is a young minister. So if you see the number of young ministers in the government of Equatorial Guinea, we all are connected. We all are, we use Zoom, we use the internet. I mean, only the, the, the minister of state are the one who uh, struggle, but right now they want to catch up. They are, they are also connecting themselves. But clearly, the good thing is that these ministers that we are in Equatorial Guinea, we understand the value of this sector. This is why we will keep supporting it. We'll be coming to this forum. And if they, next year, even if hopefully they have a new vaccine, the pandemic is finished, and so we will be inviting everybody to come here and everybody will come to Malabo because everybody knows what's in Malabo. They know our infrastructure. They know what we can do. They know that how many African 
summit that we have done, they know all the key criteria that is needed to do in infrastructure, and especially the conference center. But the key one is the young people that have another criteria, aggressiveness to get things done and language. In Equatorial Guinea, we have an average of 2.3 languages. Everybody speak Spanish, French, English, Portuguese, and even a lot of them who have gone to China, Arabic. So language is clearly something you ask. And you, I don't even want to go into our, our native languages. But right now, Equatorial Guinea is very good in language. You can come from Russia, China, you'll find somebody who speaks a language. And for us, it's very easy to be able to receive foreigners and to discuss with them in their own language. So that has been something that clearly we put us in the map. And the last one, and more important, the geographic location. Anywhere that you can go, you don't have to go either to south, to north, you are in the middle of the continent. So again, it will be the great, and we encourage the tech campus to keep doing it. And I think in 10 years, Equatorial Guinea will be no, more known about data and IT than oil and gas, hopefully. I don't know. I don't know if I, I will be there. I want to do something else. But definitely, it's going to be very criteria. And we have all the factors to make it great. Next year should be even bigger than this year. And it should be in Equatorial Guinea. There people can fly, they know our infrastructure, and we should pack the city of Malabo full of IT people. That is fantastic. I'm sure that's what we all hope for Tech Campus. Um, thank you so much, Minister Gabriel. Uh, Fidel, can you tell us your vision for Tech Campus in 10 years? Thank you, Adan. Thank you, Adan. Yeah. Um, so when I look back the previous event, uh, for Tech Campus, I'm very, very proud. Um, this year has been like a bottleneck because of the coronavirus. But you look at when this first started, you had few people participating. People didn't actually know the importance of Tech Campus. And then the next one, uh, people start to get attention on a Tech Campus. And the one last year was really, really uh, something else. So when you look at the pattern, uh, it kind of makes you to believe that uh, Tech Campus in 10 years down the road is going to be not only an event that would be remarkable for Africa, but it will also uh, make a remarkable uh, action to the entire world. So I'm very confident uh, that uh, even though with the uh, coronavirus, uh, the Tech Campus organizer have not looked back and said, well, we're going to cancel it. And the technology and the data have come together and combined to kind of prove that uh, data and technology are probably the no oil. So um, I'm very, very, very uh, excited for this uh, first time uh, getting engaged in this program. And uh, of course, Cosmos is uh, kind of working together and alongside with the organizer of the Tech Campus. Uh, the very important thing uh, that we learn, uh, which makes Tech Campus very unique, is that diversification. It's not only focused on ITC uh, only. Um, there was a panel before this one which talk about uh, agri-tech business where we had our, uh, our, uh, our panelists uh, kind of sharing uh, the ideas on uh, KIC, Cosmos Innovation Center that we have in Ghana, which has proved that um, there are a lot, lot of things out there that we can take benefit. So Tech Campus doesn't only concentrate in IT um, stuff, but it does concentrate on getting opportunities around the community and promote them. So um, 10 years down the road is going to be very, very uh, important event for the entire world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fidel. So we can count on the support of Cosmos Energy next year for the next year's edition. We will be there for you. I will hold you to that. Everyone has heard you say it. Thank you very much, Fidel. So rounding off, Thank Minister Bakale, can you please tell us where you see Tech Campus in the next 10 years? Well, I think Tech Campus has already, is already the biggest event uh, in Equatorial Guinea, uh, already. I, I think everyone agrees with that. 
uh, their campus was created uh, with three key uh, words. I remember the first ad uh, that was uh, made for Tech Campus said, learn, create, and play. So Tech Campus was created for people to be exposed to technology, to learn what they could do with technology. It was created for people to come and have fun. And it was also created uh, for people to serve as an incubators of ideas, for people to create. I think in the last three years, we have made gains on that. And in 10 years, the projection, I hope, we will consolidate on those gains. So the ideas that have been presented here, let's hope that in 10 years, those ideas would become a reality. Let's hope that in 10 years, the people that have come here to learn, uh, they will use that knowledge uh, to promote the ICT sector, to promote EG uh, abroad, and to uh, use those, uh, that knowledge to improve the, the well-being of the citizens of Equatorial Guinea. And I can add another element that I'm seeing, uh, the last, that I've, seen, I've been seeing in the last three years, is that I think Tech Campus in 10 years, uh, I want it to be an influencer of public policy regarding mm -hmm. ICT. I think we're starting to see that uh, in the first edition, it was very difficult to have ministers as panelists because no one was interested. Uh, but now we see that ministers are demanding to be panelists. So uh, Tech Campus is becoming an influencer for uh, public policy and we need to take that opportunity uh, to mobilize uh, the public administration, the government, to think more about converting Equatorial Guinea in a tech, uh, in a tech center, uh, a center for providing uh, technical uh, services in, in ICT. So we want to be tech campus as serious as an incubator, as consolidating the gains that I have already made in knowledge and creativity. And I also see it in 10 years in, as influencer to public uh, policy. Thank you so much, Minister Bakale. It's, it's, it is quite new to me, actually, to see this many ministers speaking at a conference in a country. You can usually probably get one, but to have these many, you can see how invested the government is in the success of Tech Campus. It's it's very, I'm sure it's very heartening for, for Hite and for all these employees who have worked so hard on this conference to see that the government is this supportive. Now, um, just to round up today, the first edition of Tech Campus was instituted to celebrate World Telecommunications Day. And today, like Minister Bakali said, it has become the biggest event in Equatorial Guinea. It is currently the largest technological event in Central Africa, and one of the largest in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the initial aim of the event was, it was put together with the aim of uniting entrepreneurs, innovators, developers, all the talents in the technology and communication space in order to create a professional network, promote awareness and provide opportunities in the sector. There's, there, there have been myriad activities in all the editions of Tech Campus, conferences, workshops, development, programming, design, free software, multimedia, video game design, multiplayer games. You know, we had career fairs. And this year, due to the coronavirus, you, we've all seen this, the spate of events being canceled across the world. But as a true technological event, the management of HitHead decided to take Tech Campus online. And it has been an unprecedented success. Um, Tech TV was launched on YouTube last week and it will run up until July 10th. Every day you can log on to Tech TV. There's always something happening. There's music, there's games, you know, there's speakers teaching people, there's brand awareness, there's, there's career advice, and there are panels like this which are educating the public about Equatorial Guinea. I mean, we have people from all over the world here today to see that the youth of Equatorial Guinea have a huge stake in the government. You can see the ministers, like Minister Gabriel said, this is a, these are youth ministers here. We're all young on this panel. And you can see how influential the young people are in driving the future of Equatorial Guinea. So I would like to say thank you. Thank you so much to the honorable ministers who have joined us today. 
Thank you so much to Norma and to Fidel, all of you who have taken out the time, you know, in your days to come and sit with us on this panel and discuss this extremely important topic. I'm sure you've given everybody new insights into the sector. I mean, I work in the power sector and I have gained new insights today that I know I can apply in my energy work going forward. Thank you so much to all the participants who also joined us this late. I, can, I know it's getting late in a lot of people's time zones. So I'm, we're honestly very grateful that you have stayed with us for this long. Um, thank you to all the participants, all the all people who, who ask questions. And finally, the employees of HITE who have done an amazing job ensuring that all our sound is working, our, our visuals are working, that tech TV stays running. Um, these are extremely valuable employees who have taken out their time to make sure this conference is a success. So with all of that, I would like to say thank you and good night. Thank you so much, everyone.